Every three seconds, another person is diagnosed with dementia. Worldwide, more than 150 million people will have dementia by 2050. Race Against Dementia supports early career scientists in their research around the world. Our scientists are supported by the RAD Leadership and Development Programme. Race Against Dementia is going about it the right way, invested in new talent. I think there's a lot that we could learn. Being hungry for change is the way to go. Let's beat dementia together. Hello, and thank you very much for joining us today for the live stream. Um, today, we're going to be sharing information on Race Against Dementia ARUK Fellowship funding, which uh, uh, this funding call opened last month. I'm Adam Smith. I work for Dementia Researcher, and it's we're a proud partner of Race Against Dementia and Alzheimer's Research UK. So we're really pleased to be able to share this information with you to hopefully encourage and inspire as many people as possible to, to apply for this program. Um, so yeah, we're going to hear about Race Against Dementia and the program. We're going to hear from one of the newest fellows about their experiences uh, and learn more about the eligibility and how to apply. And we're going to hear about Race Against Dementia as a charity and and how they go about things differently. For, for those that don't know, Race Against Dementia Fellowships are, we love them, they're brilliant, they're unique and incredible. The charity has been running the program for a few years now, and they've really disrupted uh, how we think about support for early career researchers, going beyond distributing funding to actually bring people in and support them as individuals um, to make the discoveries we all know we're so in desperately in need of. Um, this is actually the third time we've done one of these live streams to talk about fellowships um, and, and take your questions. But the reason why we do this time and time again is because they're constantly innovating, changing and improving and learning from the previous year's application process to improve it for next time. So they don't be fooled into thinking you can watch the last one of these we did. There will be something new. I feel like one of those, you know, the air stewards who stand on the plane and say you may have heard this before but this plane is different there's going to be something new and, and that is exactly what we're going to learn from this uh live stream today it's my pleasure to introduce our brilliant guest we have lydia beaton who is the chief operating officer from risk against dementia hi lydia hi there hi adam uh, we also have dr amy lloyd who's a rad fellow up at the university of dundee hi hi uh, and we have Dr. Leah Merceline, who's the new head of research for Alzheimer's Research UK. And first time doing something with us at Dementia Researcher. Hi, Leah. Hi, everyone. Perfect. So in order of how this is going to go, first of all, uh, we're going to hear from Lydia first, who's going to talk about the charity and the program. Then we're going to go across to Amy, who's going to talk about her experiences of applying for the for the fellowship and and what that's been like and then finally we're going to get all the details on eligibility and how to apply and that's going to come from from Leah at the end but that's enough from me everybody's got slides so you'll have to bear with us briefly while I adjust some screen things here uh, I'm going to turn uh, Lydia's slides on and turn all of us off Excellent. Thank you, Adam. That was a great introduction. Um, yeah, really pleased to be here again for a third uh, a third session to promote this fellowship. Um, and it really is a testament to the brilliant fellows that we're already supporting um, through Alzheimer's Research UK, but also some international fellows that are now in our cohort um, as to why we're able to continue this program and we're able to continue to fundraise um, to support these fellows. So thank you for, for inviting us again today. So if we go on to the next slide, I'll just tell everybody a little bit about the charity. So um, Race Against Dementia, as you can tell from that video, has um, was founded by Sir Jackie Stewart, um, who's a three time Formula One world champion. Um, he was racing in the 70s and the 80s when uh, racing was extremely dangerous. And when he retired uh, 50 years ago from Formula One, he turned his attention to improving safety um, within our races. Uh, you know, things like there weren't even paramedics at Formula One races in his day. There was, you know, crowds that were very exposed to high, highly high speed cars. Um, and he has a natural 
kind of campaigning attitude. And he saw this as a problem. And he fought really hard in the years after he retired from racing to, to make some significant changes. And those changes have continued um, to be in place and have, have saved you know, countless lives in the sport. Um, after that, he went on and campaigned a lot for dyslexia and set up the charity Dyslexia Scotland, um, campaigning a lot for um, education for people um, with dyslexia. And then very sadly, in 2016, his wife, who's pictured there, um, Helen, was diagnosed with frontotemporal dementia. And true to, to Jackie's form, he thought, well, he would, you know, find out exactly how he would, you know, solve this problem he was now facing in his life and was really shocked to realize that, the, you know, there wasn't the kind of treatments, there weren't the, the drugs available um, that would, would help Helen in, in a significant way. Um, and, you know, being spurred on again by this new problem, this new frustration, he decided to do something about it and very admirable admirably set up Race Against Dementia in 2018. Um, the philosophy is that we identify, we fund and we guide these pioneering scientists from across the world and in 2018 he set about working very closely with Alzheimer's Research UK to identify the first three fellowships um, and those three fellows um, are just coming to the end of their five-year program. So it's really nice to see now that we have effectively almost supported a whole cohort of fellows. Um, and all three of them have been incredibly successful. They've gone on to receive more funding. They've gone on to develop teams, um, be promoted within their careers, um, and really use the platform that Race Against Dementia has offered them um, in an extremely positive way. And then the kind of last point there and the philosophy of Sir Jackie, um, obviously, you know, it's 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 quite tragic, really, that the world of Formula One and the world of dementia have to come together in this way because of poor Helen. But, you know, Sir Jackie has seen this as an opportunity and he therefore wants to use um, the world that he knows, Formula One, technology, engineering and the acceleration and the pace and the precision that you get in that industry and apply it to medical research and specifically dementia research in this way. So he really is very keen that the charity um, uses this opportunity to, to disrupt the current practices um, and accelerate uh, new discoveries. And as per the introduction from Adam, it's really it's great to hear that you know the feeling is, is that these fellowships are something different and are starting to you know lead the way in how we should be supporting um, early career scientists. So the next slide, please, Adam. Um, so just a little bit about our fellowship. So this is now a global network of fellows. So we originally started working um, with just those three in the UK, working in partnership with AR UK. Um, but since 2018, we've now set up fellowships um, in the US uh, based at Mayo Clinic. We have somebody based in Amsterdam. Um, we also have three, soon to be four um, fellows in Australia working with the Dementia Australia Research Foundation, and we have two in South Africa. And our cohort is growing, and um, that's one of the real benefits is this international um, cohort of other early career researchers that um, our researchers can benefit from. So we specifically are looking for early career researchers, and we say up to six years post-PhD. And what um, is unique in a way is, is the, the level of support as well. You know, it's five years of funding, and that was something Sir Jackie was very passionate about at the beginning, um, to enable a real focus on the research rather than a shorter um, tenure of support, which would then mean that you know some of those researchers have to then continue to look for funding throughout. So it's supposed to give a bit of longevity to the funding. Um, and then alongside this um, funding, we offer a training program and that's um, drawn on what is, yeah, we call the pace and the precision of Formula One. Um, and if you go to the next slide, Alan, Adam, you'll see the uh, four sort of traits that we build our program on. So we look at the world of Formula One and have identified that really the traits that sit within Formula One that we want to be able to apply to medical research are innovation, teamwork, attention to detail and resilience. And we build our research um, development program around these four mindset traits. Um, and then you'll see at the bottom the sorts of things that we then um, offer our fellows as part of this fellowship is a development program um, built on those Formula One mindsets. Um, and that any fellow that comes into the cohort is part of that and will receive training for the whole of the five years. So we have a program that enables um, our researchers to, to join that training program. And some examples, and Amy will go into this a little bit more, but one example is an organization called Hintza, which is a 
performance um, performance coaching organization that work with Formula One drivers and they look at all aspects of your life um, as a researcher from your sleep to your diet to your exercise to your well-being and they really help you to work out how you can peak your performance at key moments whether that's at a grant uh, application interview or maybe um, you know a key experiment you need to be you know at your best for um, so really drawing on what is done in the Formula One for those driving ra um, racing car drivers ahead of their races, we are now trying to apply to, to the science world. Um, as well as the programme, we offer mentors. So we connect our fellows up with people from biotech, from Formula One, from engineering. Um, we have mentors who sit within Dyson. We have mentors who are coming from, uh, have been ex-Formula One or have worked in organisations like McLaren Applied where they, you know, the engineers that have worked on how Formula One can um, lead to new discoveries in new industries. Um, and that mentoring is really helpful for those researchers to have somebody that they can work with and, and um, you know, share, share issues, share problems um, and, and come, come up with new and different solutions. Uh, we meet once a year because we're in an international cohort. We bring everybody over uh, for a week in the summer and we do an intensive week of training. Um, and that's, I think, the fellows find really useful. Apart from anything, the training we actually do, they also get together and they get to kind of network and share ideas. And then we host um, events throughout uh, the year. So we do bi-monthly trainings. And as I've mentioned earlier, it creates this really interesting network of researchers from across the world, um, which are all related by Race Against Dementia. And that can often lead to new ideas. It can lead to new funding opportunities. We've had fellows put applications in together and be successful because they brought their research together and they otherwise probably wouldn't have crossed paths. So I think that's one of the big benefits to the programme is this global network that Race Against Dementia is creating. Um, so I think on the next slide, just um, to summarise from me, and then I'll pass over to Amy because she can talk very much more from the horse's mouth. Um, it's just that, you know, our philosophy is that the stopwatch is ticking, the race is on. Um, you know, we want to move quickly. We want to get researchers in position. Um, we want to get them uh, learning how, you know, Formula One can really benefit their research and, and work towards a, a, an acceleration of our progress within dementia research. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Lydia. I mean, it, it is it's an incredible program. I, I had the pleasure of joining you for your annual meeting this year and hearing from so many kind of inspiring people, but then also learning about the, the mentoring and, and the incredible work that everybody's doing really is uh, wonderful. And it's, it's brilliant. How many fellows are there now? So there are 18 at the moment in our cohort. Um, I was interviewing this morning, bright and early in Australia, for an additional fellow in Australia. So they should be enrolled in the, in the new year. And then obviously ARUK um, and uh, RAD fellows appointed next year will get us up to 20 at least. So very excited to, to build the cohort. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, so we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Amy Lloyd from the University of Dundee next, who's going to talk about, who was one of the, the newest, you're the, the newest fellow. Um, and you're going to talk about some of your experiences. So thank you very much, uh, Lydia. Okay, cool. So um, yeah, I'm I'm one of the the newest in the in the latest cohort of fellows. So I started in May, um, and what I'm going to be talking through really actually is the application process. That's something that I think is super essential to get that advice about just how to apply where do you start what kind of ideas um what's realistic in 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 that kind of five-year time frame so i thought i'd kind of go through that um but as lydia said you know even though i only started in may i'm already kind of um been flung into some amazing support um training um with the hinsa program so i'm more than happy to talk about that um later on as well so um, next slide, please, Adam, if that's okay. So I thought I'd just kind of go through the toolkit you kind of need um, to prepare an application for the AOUK RAD Fellowship. Um, so a lot of this might be um, known, but to me, a lot of this I just did not appreciate at the time of when I was applying for my fellowship. So um, I 
was kind of at the end of so when I applied I had a I had a three year it, you had to be kind of in in the three years post PhD and I was just at kind of at the end of that so I wasn't too sure if I was eligible and then I found out quite last minute that I was and I quickly put an application in so um I thought that I would kind of go through everything that I had to learn very quickly on how to get an application uh, ready for this uh, fellowship. So, so kind of an overview of what what do you need? So, we you need a kind of solid um, research project idea, and I'll go through that in a little bit more detail in a minute. And I'll kind of go through an example of um, what hasn't been funded for me, and then what has been funded through me for RAD. Um, Something else that you need for your applications is is a breakdown of costs. Now, as someone who, you know, is quite early on post PhD, you've never had to think about these kind of things before. It can be a bit overwhelming, but that's where your finance team are the experts in this. So one thing that I would recommend when you're starting to put together your application is to really get in contact with your finance team really early on. And they will have a really good idea of you know, how much your salary will cost, your consumables, travel, facility costs, um, everything like that that you need. Um, so I would recommend probably, and also what something that you need also is their final uh, sign off when you apply for your fellowship. So you need to really get in contact with them kind of early on because they have the final uh, send off for you. Um, you also need a, a kind of sponsor. So, you know, you need to be kind of situated in a lab with a PI. So um, you want to make sure that you're in the right lab with the right expertise or the facilities that you need that can kind of nurture you. Um, you it also, um, you know, needs to be kind of collaborative. You know, you, you can't do everything. You don't, you, they're not, you're not expected to have all the expertise um, but you are kind of expected to have some collaborations in place that will help you really build a really strong um, application. So, so getting those collaborations in place and also for the application process, you need their letters of support to show that they are going to be helping you with your fellowship. Uh, you also need to upstate CV. And something that I've kind of hinted at before this, but yeah, is time. So I would say at least six weeks before the deadline, you need to kind of be starting to to kind of build this up and getting in contact with the finance team, getting your ideas down. So um, that's kind of an overview, I would say, of, of what you need. But I'll go into a little bit more detail now in terms of kind of the research plan. That's on the next slide, if that's OK. So this is kind of my um, idea of what makes a good research plan. So I would say two to three aims is kind of a good starting point. Um, it needs to be hypothesis driven. So I would say that you need a really, um, so each of your aims usually is quite distinct, but also quite complementary to each other. But you need them to have a strong hypothesis of, of why this is important and why you're pursuing this, this aim in your research. Uh, it needs strong rationale. I would say it needs to be multidisciplinary. So, you know, bringing together different aspects of research, maybe some different technologies, um, different methodologies is always great for a strong um, research application. As I mentioned, it needs to be collaborative. Of course, it needs to be novel. And something that's amazing about the RAD Fellowship, you know, you have five years to um, do your research. And so you kind of have this scope to be pretty ambitious with what you want to achieve. But at the same time, it needs to also be realistic. So there is this kind of tightrope that you have to walk where you want your experiments and you want your aims to have quite a lot of ambition. You want, you know, you want to find out things that have not been found before. You want to use different methodologies to kind of answer your questions. But it also needs to have some kind of pilot data to support that these um, these aims are feasible. And also you need some kind of contingency plan in, in place. So, you know, what happens if something doesn't work? or doesn't go the way that you want it to, then you need to kind of have a plan B in there as well, just to make sure that your application is kind of bulletproof. Uh, next question, please. Oh, sorry, next slide. Okay, so this is just an example of, of a, a fellowship application um, that I applied for a few years ago. So this is not with RAD, um, but this is just um, a kind of example of uh, a fellowship application that just wasn't fundable. So as you can see, this was submitted in 2020. So I just finished my PhD uh, a year before that. 
I joined Dundee a few months ago um, prior to this and I just started um, using proteomics as, as a technology to look at microglia phenotypes. And so I knew that I wanted to have a project that was based around looking at microglia and Alzheimer's disease, but by using proteomics. Um, but really, I, I didn't really know how to write a fellowship and I didn't really look uh, and seek help. Also, it was during um, lockdown, so I didn't really have access to the experts uh, to kind of give me advice with this. But when I was reading this fellowship application back, it was really obvious to me why this wasn't funded. So it was just um, culturing cells and doing mass spec and proteomics. And they were my they were my aims. So it was very one dimensional. There was nothing really different apart from just doing this one kind of experiment type. Um, but at the same time as that, I had about six aims. So and they weren't super distinct. So it was it was quite um, convoluted. It was quite messy. And at the same time, there wasn't really enough detail in there. So it was, um, the, you know, there was no clear hypothesis. I didn't have any preliminary data to support my kind of aims. I didn't have a contingency plan. Um, and it wasn't really very innovative. So, you know, there was a lot of flaws with this that really there was no supporting data. It was quite convoluted. Um, and it wasn't, you know, clearly set out why this was important. And so, you know, looking back from from this time, it was really obvious to me. But but when I got this rejection, it took me, you know, um, kind of two and a half years to think about applying again, because I knew that I had to go back to kind of the drawing board, kind of get some more skills in my in my area before I felt more confident um, to reapply again. And that's the kind of beauty of the RAD Fellowship now, you can be six years post PhD. So you haven't got to rush after your PhD and try and scramble together an application. You can take your time and you can wait until you're kind of confident in your research area uh, and you've built up those collaborations before you kind of submit a really strong application. So next slide. So this is my uh, fellowship now. Um, so this is the uh, fellowship that was accepted. Um, and it's basically everything that my reject application wasn't. So here I have three clear but distinct aims. I had made sure that I had a strong rationale for why this project was important. Um, it's very collaborative. I included some preliminary data and I'll go through that in a bit about you know, what to include in your, in your applications. It is an ambitious project. It's multidisciplinary. It uses different uh, systems and different models, but at the same time, it's it's achievable in five years. Uh, and that's something that I had to ask for advice with from senior PIs, senior staff that had been through this process and, and told me what was kind of achievable in that time. And that's something I would definitely recommend doing. Um, and also what was really important, I think, in, in making this a success is that I also had had a bit more time in the lab gaining that experience and I had submitted a paper to BioArchive and so with this application I now had a paper that was out there albeit you know on BioArchive so obviously not peer-reviewed but it was showing the expertise that I'd gained during this time so it gave the reviewers more confidence that I was the right person to kind of carry this project. Uh, next slide please. So Having been someone that has applied for this fellowship and and been accepted, and also someone that has been a reviewer for other people that have applied for these fellowships, I have a bit of kind of inside knowledge as to what the reviewers are looking for, or at least what I was looking for as a reviewer, and also what seemed to work for me as an applicant. So to me, there are two main kind of aspects to a successful application that you really need to kind of hone or, or, or kind of put across to, to the reviewers. And the first one being, you know, why is it this project? Why is this project important? So, um, you know, what are the important questions that you're going to be addressing? You know, is it novel? Is there a clear plan? Do you have um, really interesting methods, but they are also well established? You know, it's not too risky. Um, and do you have the expertise and the support around you, either with collaborations or the lab that you're in, to really kind of, you know, propel this project forward? And then the second part of that is also why you, why the applicant? 
So, you know, what evidence do you bring, you know, that shows that you're the right person to carry out this project? And I think that, like, I kind of see it as like the three P's. So you don't have to have all of these, but these are the kind of three things that I look for is papers, preprints, and pilot data. Now you haven't got to have all of these, but something, you need at least these to really kind of um, support you as someone who can drive this research forward. So at least showing that you've got pilot data, preliminary data, hasn't got to be anything huge, but just to show that either the methods that you want to use are working, they're established, or just an insight into, you know, something interesting that you've seen in your experiments and how you want to kind of springboard off those findings into your bigger fellowship. And um, also, are you in the right institute? So, um, so my fellowship focuses heavily on mass spectrometry and proteomics. I'm at the University of Dundee, which has a world-renowned uh, mass spec facility. You know, so just making sure that the technology or the methods that you that you want to use or the models that you want to use, you know, you're in the right place for that. Uh, and also making sure you have those good collaborations in place. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just a bit of uh, examples of of why the project. So what is good about this project? So these are just three examples now. So I was, um, you know, I had few a few different kind of aspects to support my to support my um application and with the application you do get um, a kind of supporting document that you can provide that um, can kind of showcase you know the importance of the project or you know um, what you can bring to the project so I had three different types I guess of supporting documents that I included in my application so the first thing that I included was an experimental diagram so if you're using maybe quite a complicated model or a complicated method, or you have a very clear plan of, you know, what your experiments will look like, you need to make a diagram to clearly kind of just um, spell that out to the reviewer so they can clearly understand, OK, you're going to do this at a certain time. You're taking your cells for analysis at certain time points. So just very clear kind of visual cues is to really support the experiments that you're, that you're going to be doing. I also had some pilot data. So in this example here, you know, part of my uh, fellowship, I want to look at um, the microglia secretome. So what they are secreting. Um, and that's quite a kind of novel topic in, in proteomics to, to really get a good um, kind of proteomic analysis of secreted proteins. And so I spent a few weeks in the lab just making sure the methods were optimized to, um, to collect um, condition media for mass spec. So I had some kind of pilot data to show that actually this is achievable and I've optimized the methods for this. So that's an example of, you know, kind of what I used as pilot data. And then another aspect of this supporting document. Um, so particularly if you're if you're doing a kind of collaborative project or you're utilizing expertise that's not in your institute, you can ask your collaborators for some supporting documents as well, some support, supporting data. So um, yeah, aim three, so, um, or point three, sorry, is some data from my collaborators at Manchester. So one of the aims of my fellowship is to use imaging mass cytometry. Uh, we don't have that expertise in Dundee, but they do have it in Manchester and that's my collaboration. And so just to show that what I want to achieve with imaging mass cytometry is achievable. I asked my collaborators for some examples of some slides where they have looked at microglia and some markers. So you know, these are the kind of things that we want to see as supporting document. Um, next slide, please. And then the kind of why new part, um, it just needs to, so, so for me, this is an example for kind of me uh, and my experience. Um, so my fellowship relies heavily on, on proteomics. Um, and the only real evidence um, that I have any expertise in, in proteomics, uh, at the time at least, was this bioarchive paper. So, um, and what I found really interesting was when I got my reviewers' comments back, when I uh, wrote my application, one of the reviewers said that, you know, I have 
um, expertise in proteomics. And the only way they ever thought that was because they've seen, you know, this bioarchive paper. So it's really just to show the importance of if you have data, maybe it's not ready for a full publication, but um, or, you know, you're kind of at the beginning of that journey where you're just submitting a paper for publication. I would recommend definitely to get this on, you know, bioarchive or some or something similar, just so you have that out there and you have your name out there and you are linked to the kind of expertise that you want, um, especially if it's going to help you in your application process. Uh, next slide. So this is the last slide now. So um, this is just like some just general advice about um, preparing yourself, your application, and the stages, you know, once you've kind of submitted. So I would for sure read the literature, you know, what's already been done, what questions need to be addressed, what models can you use to take inspiration from the literature uh, for your and apply that for your for your application. I would say pick the best place for your fellowship. So, and by that, I mean, you know, where will your research thrive? So what facilities do you need? What expertise do you need? And make sure you're in the right place for that. Do you have a mentor that can help you, give you career advice, kind of nurture you as, as an early career scientist? Um, build collaborations, of course. So, you know, what expertise don't you have, but, you know, that others have that could really help with your research plan? As I mentioned, get your data on like a preprint server. That really helps show the reviewers that you're the right person to lead that research. And most importantly, talk to other people that have these fellowships. So um, like my door is always open for anyone to, to talk to me or contact me, ask for advice. I'm more than happy to chat about any aspects of the application process. Um, and also with the interview process, if you get chosen to, to interview, I really recommend doing mock interviews with the um, kind of the scariest people in your institute that will ask you the hardest questions, just so you're the most prepared that you can be for the interviews. The interviews actually are, I actually found it really enjoyable because it was it was a really nice interview. It was, uh, it was a nice discussion. And also I think because I prepared for the absolute worst grilling possible so that nothing could ever ever been as scary as that. Um, and get feedback at all stages. So, you know, people that have already got fellowships, people that are more senior in their career, you know, get their advice at all these stages and just make sure that you're um, kind of really prepared for all, all stages of the application process and beyond. And I think that's it from me. Wonderful. Thank you so much. You can come back again. I mean, just to do that talk separately. I mean, never mind about <laughs> rat fellowship specifically. I think because there's so much in there for anybody who's not just applying for a rat fellowship, but who's applying for any kind of fellowship, uh, to be honest. But congratulations. Yeah. Was, I really enjoyed that. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. <laughs> well, um, I'm here on the screen. I just want to remind anybody that if you have any questions, we're gonna ha we're gonna hear from uh, Leah in a few moments. But if you have any questions and you're watching on YouTube, you can post those in the chat below. I can't quite tell if YouTube's lagging a little bit behind or if the slides are behind, but it, it looks like YouTube's a little bit behind what's happening on live. So do, but either way, do post your questions in the chat at the bottom. And if you want to ask any of uh, the guests here, whether that's um, uh, Leah or Amy or Lydia, you can post those in the chat. And if you're watching on YouTube, you can uh, on Twitter X, you can um, post their uh, reply to the live stream below. Whether you're watching on my feed or on the Dementia Researcher feed, but do tag in at Dementia Research at Dem underscore Researcher, so I can be sure to find that. So yeah, get those questions flowing, and uh, that's enough from me. We'll hear from our very last speaker, um, who is Dr. Leah Merceline from Head of Research from Alzheimer's Research UK. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. So my internet is being a bit sketchy, so I really hope this um, will hold out and work for everyone. Um, we're at AIR UK really happy to be partnershiping with um, Race Against Dementia for these fellowships to help sort of administer the grant management processes. Um, and before I go into sort of the eligibility and the um, timeline of how we of the review process, I just thought it would be worth highlighting our new um, research strategy. Um, so next slide, please, Adam. Thank you. 
Um, so some of you might have already noticed that our branding has changed a little bit and it kind of also corresponded with me um, starting this new role. So um, it's still very much looking at um, research for dementia, but really trying to focus in on treatment, diagnosis and prevention. And the fellowships could be within any of those areas, including understanding the mechanisms that support each of those areas as well. Um, so just wanted to highlight that um, in terms of the sort of overarching remit of Alzheimer's Research UK. Next slide, please, Adam. And so here is just the main eligibility criteria. And um, there are some more that can be um, found on our website. Uh, but as I said, focus on treatment and diagnosis of prevention, um, as well as sort of understanding um, the mechanisms in those areas and and as Lydia had already mentioned and Amy that you can be up to six years post PhD um, in order to apply for the application and this can be adjusted um, for part-time working and career breaks so that will be taken into account. Um, the other thing just to mention that if you have applied before you are um, welcome to reapply but you would need to outline all of the changes um, to your application in relation to the feedback that you um, received last time. Um, and applicants that haven't already um, received their PhD award can apply as well, but there would need to be proof of the PhD award by the time of the final grant review meeting, which I'll outline sort of the rough timelines for that on the next slide in a second. Um, as um, sorry, <laughs> sorry, Adam. Um, as Amy had mentioned, you do need to have a host um, organisation. So um, that can be a not-for-profit institution, or it could be a um, or a research institute, an academic institution. Um, you do need to have a supervisor um, or co-supervisor at that host institution with a fixed-term contract for the duration of the project. Um, and so comments are encouraged. So um, as um, Amy pointed out in her really, really helpful advice is that collaboration and um, that side of things is really, really encouraged. So if you um, have secondment opportunities, that is very welcome. If you know about that already, having letters of support in place is really helpful, but we understand that things change. And so you can get in contact with us if you do, um, if you are, able to, um, if you are awarded the funding, to say actually we would like to do an, a secondment and we can we can make plans for that as well. And really importantly, the deadline for applications is the 31st of January. Um, next slide please, Adam. Okay, so this is our um, general grant review um, cycle. So once the application is submitted um, and applications are open at the moment, um, there is a triage after the deadline. So there's an internal triage, um, firstly, to validate that the applications um, meet the sort of eligibility criteria, as well as um, whether, whether they're um, in, you know, meeting all those criteria. And then after that point, you, it goes through a triage with our grant review board, where they will um, score all of the applications and there will be a cutoff. Um, score of which the ones that meet that cutoff are um, put through to external peer review and lay review. So the external expert review um, you'll all be familiar with and our lay review aspect is for people with lived experience to comment on the applications and this is particularly for applications that are involving human volunteers. And then there's a chance for applicants to um, have a rebuttal to those to any points and comments that are raised at the review point and um, so that that the, that response to the reviews as well as the review and the applications all then go to our grant review board to have a big discussion about which applications should be recommended for funding at that point the recommendation is looking solely on the um, re the application and the ones that are shortlisted would then go and be asked to come for interview. Those interviews typically would take place roughly two weeks later. And after the interview, um, and sorry, the people interviewing would be um, the chair of the GR, 
uh, the grant review board and the designated panel members who have been assigned your application to sort of do the in de detail talk about it. Um, and then there would be representatives um, uh, from AI UK and RAD um, at the, potentially at the interview. Um, the final recommendations then would go to um, our trustees. Um, I've put CEA approval there as well because some of our applications for other grant rounds, if depending on um, the amounts, might not go to trustee level. Um, they might be approved by our CEO, but then after that, we would put out our offers and um, award letters and contracts um, sent out, and then hopefully it won't take too long to, to organise signatures and everything, but that's why it's really important to have your finance team on board, as Amy said, because then they're aware of what's coming and hopefully that sort of expedites the process. That whole sort of review cycle um, would take roughly about four to five months. So um, from the point of uh, the end of the deadline, so 31st of January is the deadline and we hope to have outcomes um, at, in around June um, 2024. Um, next slide, please, Adam. And so that's a very brief overview of the review cycle. I'm Unfortunately, our grants manager couldn't attend today and she, she knows all of the answers to these things, but um, I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. And if I can't, email address. Um, I just did want to note that you can email at any point, but the office is closed between Christmas um, from the 22nd of December to the 2nd of January. So you might not get a response during that period, but we do our best to get back to everyone as quickly as possible. So thank you very much. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so now's your chance. Anybody who's uh, watching, uh, if you're watching on YouTube, you can post your questions in the chat. And if you're watching on X, do um, post them and just make sure you tag at dem underscore researcher. And I will put those to everybody. And on the screen right now is a QR code, which will take you to the funding call information, which has all been published online and then ultimately off to the programs. Uh, while we're waiting for questions, I've written some down just in case nobody asked any anything. Um, so first question I've got is... And I ask this every time, I know the answer, but I'm not necessarily sure that anybody watching would, uh, is what about people who are outside the UK? So for this um, particular fellowship, for from an ARUPK perspective, it would be within the UK. But I know that um, um, maybe Lydia wants to comment on some of the international work that you're doing. Yeah, exactly. So these are our UK based fellowships. So we expect the host institution be, to be a UK institution. But we do, as I mentioned in my presentation, have some international fellowships running like in Australia. So if an applicant is in a different country and wants to know more, then um, again, they can get in touch with Race Against Dementia. Can I give you a scenario where if somebody say in the US, but has a collaboration where they could have a UK host and a UK supervisor, but also do some work in the but but in the in the us for example would somebody like that be eligible to play i know a lot of people who watch uh these and visit our channel are are in the us particularly mm. uh my understanding is ARUK, the home home institution has to be uk based yeah so as long as the home institution's yeah. uk based and there's a supervisor there it's possible you could still do work else elsewhere Yes, right. somebody mentioned the comments uh, and absolutely encouraged and some of our fellows have, have done them and it's really, you know, bolstered their experience um, and enabled them to kind of build their network internationally. I think, is it Cara Croft, um, one of your fellows has spent time in Florida as well as at UPM? Right. Yeah, uh, that's right. And what about moving institutions? You don't have to stay at this. You can take your, your fellowship follows you. So if you go to one place and but you're thinking I might need to move to another part of the country or my family situation changes, it's possible to, to move that fellowship with you. Yeah, again, we've had that example. Um, Cara Croft has just not long moved to Queen Mary's, one of our original um, fellows. Uh, Cara was uh, part of that 2018 um, cohort. Uh, so, yes, yeah, she's moved institution and the fellowship has moved with her for the time that the fellowship continues. So my next question was, um, I know ARUK have been one of the great organisations really pushing the importance of narrative CVs and, and these story CVs. Is, is a narrative CV part of this 
application process or is that different to the normal AR UK fellowship? So we haven't updated the application um, from last year. So I will revert to Lydia for that side. But it, it, narrative CVs is definitely something that we have been um, piloting through some of our projects. And it's something that we want to implement um, more broadly in the sort of next round. So if it isn't already included, it is, um, it is something that probably will be in the next time that we run this. So review the guidance notes, essentially, I guess. See what Carol wants. Exactly. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I think, I, I mean, I think, so for those that don't know, narrative CVs are very much this kind of where you can take credit. It's not just about publications. And I think if you're applying mm. for this fellowship and you are at the very earliest stages, it's not unreasonable that you're not going to have a page full of papers and publications to your mm. name but what you will have exactly. is experience in teaching or presenting or doing science communications or outreach and these things which you you can take credit for uh and the review board will will make sure that they you know that they count just then as much so somebody who's less senior will still be in with a chance don't assume that that person who's six years post phd will have the better will be the better candidate because you're just finishing your PhD. So yeah. either way, it's good stuff to include in your CV. Right? I think the other thing to add there, Adam, is um, as Leah said, there will be representatives from Race Against Dementia on the panel. And you know, one of our areas that we're looking for is somebody who can really utilize the platform that the fellowship um, allows. And having some of the experience that you've just listed as examples, you know, are all things that we would suspect would lead to somebody who was you know going to maximize the opportunities that race against dementia provides so as well as obviously the science you know comes first and center but also having somebody with perhaps an interest in science communication you know really keen to progress um their presentation skills the way they communicate their science all of these things are also part of the program so you know that will feed into the to the interview process and that's a key part, isn't it, Amy? You you get lots of, I mean, in addition to getting funding and doing the great science, there are lots of opportunities as part of this fellowship to to get out there and to do more. What what kind of activities have you done since you joined the program? Yeah, it's it's such a unique opportunity as an early career fellow to get that much um, kind of nurturing and training into becoming, you know, such a well-rounded. Um, researcher, leader, it's it's incredible actually. So for example, for me, uh, as Lydia mentioned, so, um, you know, Rad and uh, team up with Hintza, which are a kind of um, performance coaching uh, uh, company. And, and with that, you get kind of advice and coaching on all mm -hmm. aspects of your life and often in things that you would never think would actually help you in terms of your career. So for example, um, one of the main things that I talk about um, with Hintza um, is fitness. Um, and that's because when I was filling out my uh, survey on things, on aspects of my life that I thought I needed kind of, that I thought were lacking or I needed help with, um, that was the area that I kind of was flagged for me as being something that I needed to improve. Um, and actually, it's incredible how much it's helped me in the lab and in general. So so um, I've been given quite a lot of advice on, you know, I wanted to get fitter. I wanted to do a lot more running. You know, I've been given advice with having a training program. I run before work and just having that kind of schedule and that advice in place, I just feel so much more energized at work and I feel so much more productive at work. And I would never think that that part of my life would ever actually impact my career part of my life and it really has I, I just feel like so much more energized at work and therefore I'm so much more switched on my ideas are better I'm much more productive so that has helped me massively um, and then another aspect of of the training um, is um, not with hints but is looking at you know personality types um, your kind of leadership um, how to be, um, you know, kind of leading and establishing a lab. So one thing that is missing with every other early career fellowship 
is any kind of nurturing to 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 get to that next stage of your career you know often you're given that money if you're lucky and that's it you're kind of left to your own devices for two to three years uh, and they hope at the end of it you're you're you figured it out for yourself where where rad and AR UK really give you the tools you need to to build your lab build your independence um you know work with understanding how different personality types work how to manage people um from kind of diverse backgrounds um different approaches to managing you know teams and issues and all of these things that are so essential to becoming um a lab leader that you would normally have to go out of your way to seek externally and all of that is part of the rad AO UK package and, and and it's just incredible and you know I've only been with with um this fellowship since May and I already feel like I have all of these tools um to start building my lab. I have these new ideas, you know, the different avenues that I want to explore and I have, you know, in mind, you know, how to achieve that. And that wouldn't have been possible, you know, without the kind of nurturing uh, um with with this fellowship. I, I, again, I love that. I, I've talked so many times about that idea of that Race Against Dementia took this attitude of treating scientists like Formula One drivers. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be good on race day if you haven't slept well or if you're yeah. stressed or anxious or if you've not got the right exercise regime. And working with Hinsta to, to really think of you as an athlete mm -hmm. uh, who will hit the lab running every day to, to be on it and doing your best being your best self, I think, is is an incredible idea. I, yeah. We should be doing that for everybody. This shouldn't be a rad. I mean, everybody should be stealing that idea from rad <laughs> and applying it uh, because I think that's it's brilliant. You're right, and academia yeah. particularly, we know it's a stressful, um, hard environment to work in. So if you can get that support, that's that's brilliant. Mm -hmm. And also, as well, you mentioned there about thinking about this 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 fellowship long commitment so this is a five-year fellowship but really investing in in you and having this success measure of what comes next that actually yeah. the fellowship won't have it's not just about what you discover during that five years but what you're going to go on to become really sets you up which is why i think uh, again it's it's a brilliant program I mean, if we're selling this to people <laughs> who are watching apply now deadline 31st of january details in the qr code here in the top left hand corner of the screen um do do make sure you you click on that we have had a question uh stared above from who is in the netherlands has raised this question that i did which they're based in the netherlands um, could you help already uh, during the application progress to find a uk supervisor um I, I i can see how that's a tricky one i think if you there isn't something i would expect race against dementia to necessarily help with but i'm sure if you get in touch with ar uk or drop us a line um, if this is something you're interested in in doing um, and haven't really got connections or collaborators in the UK, I'm sure we could help make some introductions to somebody that might be uh, interested in working with you. Um, I, I have another question, which is, um, is there a particular kind of type of research? Because when we, we've been talking about this innovation, fast paced connections to Formula One, is there a particular kind of research that you want to see you know is it high risk high reward or is it kind of particularly techie stuff do you or, or are you really just open is there, is there any research you'd particularly like to see come forward in this um well i think lee has certainly um really well spelled out the three areas and we do stick to treatment diagnosis prevention and so we're we're open to all areas we don't um as many people know support um dementia care um being well, you, you support dementia care we, you don't fund research into, into that. yeah yeah sorry i said that wrong but you're absolutely no, right no, no, so no. we don't fund research into care um however your point about high risk projects i mean i think one of the benefits to it being a five-year fellowship is it does enable that bit of extra risk um and i would say if if there was a charity to back high risk projects it would be ours because we're we're open to that um my scientific advisors would always tell me that, that as long as there's a contingency plan as well which is also very important but again having that extra tenure allows for you know things to go wrong and for a researcher to learn and either apply a contingency plan or um 
you know, or carry on, you know, and, and hopefully get high reward from the risk that they're taking. Um, we also fund a program with Rose Trees Trust, uh, which is a Race Against Dementia team program. And the th same question came up when we were asked about that. And again, the same approach is that, yes, we're open, very open to high risk projects as long as there's a plan, it's well thought through and the scientific data is. You've still, yeah. still got to get them past the review panel, right? But I think the <laughs> idea here is, is that if you've got a creative idea, don't be put off. And, and those are definitely encouraged. Um, you mentioned, so what are the key differences this round to last round? We uh, think at the start you talked about this being six years post PhD. So that's new, isn't it? Because it, it used to be shorter. Yeah, it used to be three years. Um, and it's lucky I didn't realize that we only just managed to catch Amy in that three years. Um, and that is partly why we have done that. It's just to widen that pool. Um, and there are people that I'm sure again it sort of depends on where the process sits within the year as well and there have been people that have missed out because of that restriction um so that's why we've increased it to six years um but equally would would you agree that you don't want people to be put off and assume that just because you've literally just finished your phd that you're gonna have less chance of getting it than somebody who is six years down the line and has done a few mm -hmm. postdocs and already finished another ARUK phd that's not gonna that's not gonna have an impact no, I would say I would I would say absolutely we would encourage everyone within that whole um, guide to apply. And as I think Amy's guidance was just fantastic because if, as long as you've thought through that plan and and going back onto the sort of high risk research, I think as long as it's there is some sort of pilot data or something to show that you could achieve this, it is achievable. It's really novel and innovative, but you are the right person to be delivering that research with the contingency plans. As Lydia mentioned, that's what we're looking for. We're not looking for someone at the end of that limit. It's anyone within that, as long as the application is strong application. Um, I think this kit, this was a question that somebody asked last time. It's not come up this time, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, I, can you apply if you've submitted, but not yet had your fiver? I think it, you could before. Is yes. That the Yes, uh, I believe so. As long as you, um, so as, as long as you have your, your PhD awarded by the grant review board meeting, then you can apply. So that is roughly about three months after the application deadline. So it's a potential. It's quite high risk because you might not quite make it. Um, so I, I would so as say long as you by, by April, uh, April, end of April. It doesn't matter if you've not yet had it well, and you're expecting to pass. Oh, well, no, you've got to do any amendments. Yeah, exactly. So that's, okay. that's what I'm thinking amendments wise. Yeah, so it might be safer to do it after um, afterwards, survivor, but you don't know how long your amendments might be. So this is your last chance now, anybody watching to ask questions during the live stream. But if you're watching this on Catch Up on, on YouTube or on X, um, you can get in touch to ask questions. Uh, what what details should they use? I mean, we'll repost them to you if you send them to us. If they if they go in YouTube, by all means, post them there and we'll pass them along. But what, what are the contact details? Uh, so for, from, for, from AR UK, it would be research at Alzheimer's research uk.org so right. email your question and um there and we'll try and get back as quick as possible and um, so the way it works and this has again been articulated already but just to confirm is that AR UK run the process on behalf of race against dementia so if it's a process related question um then absolutely use that email that leah just gave if it's a specific question to race against dementia the the training then um, it's info at raceagainstdementia.com um, obviously also on um, socials and, and through our website. Brilliant and so I know certainly a Dementia Researcher in the past has uh, we've got some previous talks from uh, previous live streams to ask about the fellowship program so don't necessarily rely on the detail in that but I think it, there is lots of information in there about the fellowship program as a whole which is much the same uh, we've also published some blogs and podcasts in the past by some of the uh, some of the fellows who's talked about their experience and what they did so by all means go and have a look at them I know that all the rad 
fellows are incredibly approachable as well. So um, uh, what we can do is, uh, if you're not sure who they are, reach out to us or to Race Against Dementia and we can put you in touch if you want to have a conversation about that. But uh, I think we're almost out of time. Are there any last, I'm gonna give you, go around the, to go around the room and give you a last chance to to sell this uh, to anybody who's watching who's a little bit unsure. They're kind of thinking, well, I'm not sure I'm seen enough or it's not quite the right time. What would you say to somebody like that? Um, Amy, I'll come to you first. Well, um, so I would say, you know, if you've got a, if you're really passionate about your research and you have a really great idea, uh, I would say, ask for advice and just apply. So for instance, for me as a fellow, so I started in, in May, and since then I've been given an independent investigator award from the university. So I'm now an independent fellow. So I'm starting to build my lab. Um, you know, and I have had so many amazing opportunities um, because of Air UK and RAD that have been amazing in supporting my career anyway, even previous to this. But um, it's just really changed, um, you know, my career trajectory, and it's really galvanized me to be the best researcher I can, be the best leader I can, so I really can't recommend uh, this fellowship enough. Awesome. What about you, Lydia? Um, well, I think Race Against Venture, we're really proud of the kind of diverse cohort that we've created, and, you know, there are people that join straight out of their PhD, there are others who have more experience, and everybody's from different backgrounds and brings something to the cohort. So on that basis, I don't think that there is a, a mold that everybody must stick to if they want to apply. I think it's really open to, to new ideas and, and we're prepared to be challenged. So um, And so yeah. many opportunities. I, I know that the fellows this year have had the training, but then also gone to the to help uh, contribute towards the fundraising as well and talk about yeah. their research in uh, Formula One races and uh, sporting events and, and so many great opportunities, which is, yeah. makes the programme really unique. And um, Amy's contribution today is testament to it. You know, she's spoken brilliantly and given some really practical advice. So thank you. Excellent. And uh, Leah, we'll give you the final word. Or maybe not. Leah? Would you anything like to add there at the end? Okay. <laughs> Her internet finally gave up. <laughs> yeah, the 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 um the connection there, sadly. Well, once again, um, you've got the details uh, on our website. We'll put the links in with the show notes as well. Do reach in, reach out. Get oh no, it's fair. And um, we'll look forward to um hearing about all your applications and the research that you're doing uh, through the review panel later in this year. So thank you very much. Do deadline 31st of January and uh, do get in touch if you have any more questions. I'm going to play us out uh, and we're going to hear from Sir Jackie uh, with one last play out uh, who's going to talk about the programme. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody. One in three people born today will die with dementia. Every three seconds, another person is diagnosed with dementia. Worldwide, more than 150 million people will have dementia by 2050. Race Against Dementia supports early career scientists in their research around the world. Our scientists are supported by the RAD Leadership and Development Programme. That's Race Against Dementia is going about it the right way, investing in new talent. I think there's a lot that we could learn. Being hungry for change is the way to go. Let's beat dementia together.